Hello and welcome along to the RTE Rugby Podcast. Bernard Jackman and Johnny Murphy are here with me this week as we look back and forth between rounds one and two of the Investec Champions Cup. And fellas, I'm going to dive straight in with just an overall thought of, of round one. Just one win for the four Irish provinces across the weekend. Two wins out of the eight URC sides in the Champions Cup. Seven out of eight for the Premiership. Birch, is there is there anything that we can read into that, or is it just a bit of a week one anomaly? I'd say, obviously, it shows the Premiership are, are definitely stronger than than may, than they have been over the last couple of years. I don't think it necessarily means that the winner will come from the Premiership, but probably the the general strength and depth is better. And and it, it is a worrying weekend for for the Irish provinces, really. Um, and like if if we were to have similar results this weekend, there would be a um a big setback because Europe is normally when we come uh, to a four, particularly in the group stages. So yeah, I think it's a, the warning sign. Um, th- like the reality was Munster's result against Bayonne is probably the, probably the worst result of them all. Um, even though obviously Connacht got hammered by, by Bordeaux and Bath uh, beat Ulster. I just think Bayonne, uh, you know, the weakest French team hadn't really any interest in it. Speaking to the coach beforehand, you know, they were delighted to, to, to be in Tomond. Um and have an opportunity to play against Munster, but they certainly have no ambitions to do anything in it, and will rotate their squad, um, to prioritize the top fourteen. So that's probably the biggest setback. Um, but yeah, it wasn't it wasn't a good weekend for Irish provinces, no. And Johnny, then, like, is it a case where if if you see something similar this weekend, you'd actually start to be a little bit concerned? Whereas now you can kind of potentially write it off as a little bit of an anomaly, and obviously as well, we're in a World Cup year where team's preparations have kind of been been altered a little bit so you do get some some funny odd results uh yeah i suppose on the overall premiership thing you know i i think people probably were lured into a false sense of security because a lot of talk about the league itself and you know how difficult and then obviously the interview with the newcastle coach the week before um you know and leicester and the financial issues that are associated with the league but the league is still incredibly competitive and the top six seven teams are are really good um and I think it's a it's an overall view of what the league and the the issues that are associated with English rugby and people might have thought oh well you know that translates to form but it it, it doesn't because they're still top top quality sides and they've really good players um yeah I think the uh, you know I completely agree with Birch yeah I think the Munster one is one where you go oh they had enough and even at the end they had opportunities to win it um and they didn't grind it out which is very unlike them. Um, but yeah, it's um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see you know when when people are talking this time next week, what has happened. But it certainly wasn't a wasn't a good start at all. Yeah, one of those conversations we can put a pin in and come back to next Wednesday. Uh, when we know the the second round of results, we'll start with Leinster though because they were the the Irish winners of the weekend and the big winners of the weekend. Uh, maybe not on the scoreboard, but if you're talking about the the standard of opposition, beating the defending champions La Rochelle in France, Birch, um, no trophies handed out for us. It's the opening round of the competition. There is an enormous amount of rugby to be played between now and May, but that was a significant day for Leinster in France on Sunday. Yeah, and you can see what it meant to the players. You can see what it meant to the fans. I mean, they're just sick of of, of losing to La Rochelle, and um, it was definitely. I think it was more important for Leinster to win um, than La Rochelle to win. Obviously, La Rochelle are protecting their home record. It would be a, a, sig- a real opportunity for them to put another bullet in the head of Leinster. And La Rochelle certainly were, were up for it. Um, I thought it was a great, it was a great contest. Um, two sides going at each other. Um, surprise, there's no sighting um, from it, to be honest. I thought the, uh, it was on, on the edge of reckless at times, but... That's what it needed to be, um, and yeah, neither, neither side asked for asked for forgiveness or or um any leeway, and it was just going at each other. I think La Rochelle missed Aldrich massively. I think he plays La Rochelle win, uh, just on in that game because he he has the ability to um to make such a difference, and also just line out wise they they imploded and um and seemed to lose their head a little bit, and he seems to keep that group not calm because they're not calm, but just in, in line enough. Um so that was lucky for Leinster. Uh but Leinster the it's got I I, I want to wait for a few weeks to say if it's all down to to different defence. I mean the defence was obviously more aggressive 
Um, I was obviously uh, a lot a lot more like a South African defence. But to be fair, given the conditions, um, that was probably always going to happen anyway because it was just going to be so hard to get the ball into wider channels. So, uh, but it was a good defensive performance from Leinster, obviously to keep them keep them trial. So I think Leinster will come come back. Larchelle now have to go to Stormers. I think this weekend. I I think Larchelle will be fine. Um, they just obviously for them a home home last sixteen match would be um. Uh, very very rewarding for them, but they are good enough to go anywhere and win as they've done in the past. So, uh, I think we'll see these two teams again in the in the local stages play each other. Yeah, it was great, and and Johnny, like it, it felt significant not just for Leinster to to win the game itself or win in France, but I think the the nature of the match and the the way the game panned out, uh, the ebb and flow of it, where it was a it was a dirty afternoon, bucketing down rain and. There weren't a lot of tries scored. Leinster didn't like play La Rochelle off the park or run in five tries and just put the foot down. It was tough, attritional rugby and the kind of game that we've seen Leinster lose in the last few years. Yeah, they did it dirty, really. Like, you know, and beforehand, there was a bit of a nervous nervousness around given that... um, uh, the way the conditions were and everyone was just kind of, you know, presuming that, um, you know, the power of La Rochelle, the home, you know, the home fans would would get on top purely because of the conditions. Uh, Leinster soaked up so much pressure from them. Uh, their line out bared at the front of the line out when he line outs in the 22. If they went up to compete, they made a made a mess of it. Uh, their Maldi was excellent. And they really, really stood up physically. And, you know, that line speed, you know, again, the conditions lead to any team when you play in those conditions, you're just going to ramp up your line speed. So it's difficult to see whether, you know, whether it obviously is, you know, hopefully it's going to be a team that their D is going to be as aggressive as it was uh, this weekend. Um, but yeah, they they certainly did it in a way where they just stood up and, uh, and you know, they knocked them back continuously uh, they were aggressive at the breakdown, um, and they just really kind of their 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 kicking game was smart. Um, they just control, you know. They even though they were on the pin of their collar for a while, they 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 just got it done, which is which is really good to see. And and there was a lot of pressure on them, um, you know, mentally to be able to get that monkey off their back and get that win away away from home against that opposition. And really impressive as well. Either one of you to. Who wants to come in off, off this? But really impressive. I thought the just the final quarter of an hour of the game, where for most of that second half, even though Leinster were just about keeping their head above water, it felt like La Rochelle were were hanging in there and were essentially just kind of primed to to launch it on the last fifteen minutes and and snatch that victory like they had done at the Aviva Stadium back in back in May. But it felt like for the final ten minutes, all of a sudden Leinster got out of their own 22 where they'd had to do so much defending and were just playing in the right areas of the field. They were kicking the ball when they got it. They were just keeping La Rochelle pinned back and eventually they got that reward with the final penalty that, that Kieran Frawley landed from from the ends of the world. Yeah, yeah. they've def- they definitely learned or, or certainly looked like they'd learned from, from previous games where they didn't finish strong. They, they finished stuck... Um, uh, are under pressure either having to score like you saw in Aviva last year or the year before in Marseille um, defending and um, I thought it was it was much better as you said they didn't mess around they got some key turnovers obviously they probably got they definitely got away with one with James Ryan pulled um, pulled the arm of the lifter in the line out which La Rochelle were incensed about and um, yeah it, it was a big moment to be fair but I think if La Rochelle catch that they score you know um, their mall was starting to 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 do a little bit of damage, so uh, Leinster certainly rolled their luck. Like if Leinster played La Rochelle this week in La Rochelle, you wouldn't put your house on Leinster. You know, there's nothing between these two teams at the moment. Um, obviously from an Irish point of view, you hope that Leinster will continue to uh, improve. But not their general play for the last four or five years has been excellent. But understand how to win those big games um, and close it out. So that's obviously where Leinster and Nina Barr's job is to come in and add that. Um. But yeah, I, I didn't go away from the game feeling in any way that La Rochelle couldn't be fat champions again. No, definitely that not. Moment, yeah, go ahead. That moment, that moment was so important because, um, 
you know, the hooker then spent the next two minutes kind of nearly at Carly about how he missed it. And then the next line out he had, he overthrew. And Leinster got a turnover again. So it really affected the the kind of psyche of the of the La Rochelle players and it ultimately cost them the game. They weren't able to kind of just park it and move on, but they kept going at the ref, you know, and it was clear on the ref, Mike, he was saying, look, sometimes you make mistakes. It was missed, but we we get on with it. And um, I think from a, as a momentum shift, that just really sucked the life out of them and cost them from an accuracy perspective. When the game was, the as Bert said, they, Leinster looked like they were slightly trying to creep, but that momentum shift just gave them an extra opportunity to fill their lungs and get the ball back off the next line out again. Well, coming back on to like staying on that subject and James Ryan had a similar issue in the first half with, with Matt Carley, where obviously Ryan and Gary Ringrose this season for Leinster are the, the co-captains and you could pick it up on the ref mic for large portions of that first half. It was a real back and forth first half. There was a lot of off the ball stuff, bit of niggle, and James Ryan on a handful of occasions was was calling for for pe- either penalties or you know for Matt Carley to start looking at yellow cards for for La Rochelle players. Eventually, the referee says to him he's not speaking to him to him anymore, and he essentially goes to Gary Ringrose and tells him, "You are you are the captain from this stage. I'm only communicating with you." It got me thinking, Birch. I I can't actually figure out is this is this an indictment on the the strategy of having co-captains or is it actually an endorsement on it where obviously James Ryan got completely on the wrong side of Matt Carley but then on the flip side he actually had a second man who he could go to and say well I'll speak to you from now on I I genuinely actually for half a Sunday I was thinking yeah that's that co-captaincy that's showing that up and then the more I thought about it I went Actually, it nearly worked out in their favor in the end. I can't figure it out. What's your no? What's your uh, look, I look at. I don't. I. I think. I. I see the. What, I see the way your mind is working. But, um, <laughs> you need to see somebody. Uh, no, but <laughs> I don't. I think. I think the initial idea was from Leinster is that you have, um, a shared responsibility. Obviously, someone coming in after Johnny. It's, it's a big, big role. Um, and I don't think it was because I don't think when they made that decision to have co captains, it was designed in case. What happens on Saturday happens, and the ref or the or Sunday, the the cap, the first captain or one of the captains gets to the wrong side, and he has to move across. In actual fact, we've seen since post World Cup, since pretty much the first game back, referees have been taking way less um, feedback or crap or communication with players. Now, there's always a line where sometimes if if it's not the captain um, and they're being shooed away. Sorry, if he is the captain, he's been shoot away. It can be a little bit tricky, but I, I, I think that we're lucky enough to hear have ref mics um, a lot of the time. The amount of noise and chatter that referees are getting now um, is insane, and they probably do need to, to stamp it out. And and James then sort of come come out and said, "Look at how we communicate is is very important." So I think they would realize that that that's um, that wasn't a good thing. And obviously they were lucky. Yeah, they had Gary Ringrose could be next in line, but. The reality is, I think it's not designed for that. It's designed, um, in terms of how the squad is led and one for you know one forward, one back. Hopefully, one of them will always be fit, um, and you get some consistency there. But I think James will look at James. James is the kind of player that Leinster probably, um, like when he went off last year in the final against La Rochelle, um, he was missed. You know what yeah. I mean? He 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 yeah. does give them that physicality, and it's very hard to play the game. That he plays where you're just going around smashing people, um, and then five seconds later be able to, I suppose, communicate in a in a controlled way, um, with a referee, and and that's why, to be honest, like a lot of the coaches who've had him haven't been as quick to anoint him captain as as others. Like he's been a leader for the last five or six years, and um, but yeah, so it, it's just difficult, and he's he's going to have to obviously learn how to to do that, um, and he's different than O'Connell. O'Connell, what? O'Connell was 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 a line-out general, a, a very good player, very aggressive as well. But he wasn't the same personality as 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 James. So um, I think that was a great experience for for James Ryan, and he know he'll know now he has to get better. And I, I also admire Carly for doing it because um, we do need to see it stopped. Because if not, look at players players will do anything to get over to get a win, um, and they will push and push and push and push and push. So you probably do need strong refereeing as well, who say I'm not going to tolerate it. Yeah, and it, like as as Bert said, it is something Johnny that we're seeing 
clamped down on a little bit more. Like Leinster had their own issues against Munster where they'd, I think, twice they had penalties marched 10 metres back as well by, I think it was Chris Busby was refereeing that night as well. It's obviously something referees are a little bit more keen on now to just make sure players are staying in lane a little bit more during games because, like, we hear it on the ref mic and stuff and you could hear it as well on, on Sunday. There's just so much chatter non-stop between both sets of players towards the officials. Yeah, and it's obviously something that is coming from our rugby because it's a clear stand from anyone and when we pick it up on the ref mic and a big thing you hear in a lot of games and a lot of uh, referees saying if there's any appealing for yellow cards or asking for that, I'm going to end up giving ye, ye yellow cards. So stuff like that, they're just trying to stamp it out and... To be fair, the one thing a lot of people will give out, you know, and they'll not give out, but they'll kind of, you know, go on about how the English referees talk to players, he'd be by calling them by name or that kind of stuff. But that's good. It's clear. It's mm-hmm. obvious. They can have a conversation. Um, you know, they like Matthew Carley. They not necessarily admit fault, but they are very clear that look. I missed that. What, what what can you do? Like that's it. We get on with it. So I think that that's really important. But it has to be a two way uh, conversation there. Then that if 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 the referees are are communicating like that, players have to step up and uh, and be better and manage their tones. And there's ways of asking at things. You know, you look at the likes of. You know, Martin Johnson, one of the most aggressive players to play, but how he communicated with referees for a long period of time, very controlled um, in in loads of facets of the game and asked questions in the right way. So that's just what needs to happen now. And it is something that everyone as a collective, you know, from schools to clubs to provincial to international, we all need to be better on. Uh, moving it back onto the, the positives for Leinster, Kieran Frawley, the man can can do no wrong these days, regardless of what number and uh, what number is on his jersey. And spare a thought for poor old Harry Byrne as well, who actually got his chance and was playing quite well for those thirty nine minutes until he picks up the head injury. He's ruled out for this weekend. So Birch, it looks like we're more more than likely going to be seeing Kieran Frawley starting at ten this week. Honestly, Leo picks Sam Prendergast, but no, I think um, I, I think he he will go with Frawley. Uh, and look at maybe. Having been someone who has had no luck for a while um, in terms of injuries, maybe the the unfortunate injury to Ross and Harry would give him his his chance, and and then it's up to him to take it. At the moment, he just seems to be in a in a really rich vein of form, um, and also in a really good place mentally. I think he he realizes this is his moment to to make a stake to be a starter. Um, whereas I don't know. If you really believe that, you know, up to now, or if if it was likely, obviously it's still unlikely that he's going to be a starter, a fullback, or or center. Just the players Leinster have there, but there's there's a bit of a vacancy there at ten, especially with Ross out. So he needs to capitalize on that. I thought he was his interview before the Munster game on RT. He said, "I want to play more at ten. And then obviously for La Rochelle, he was back on the bench, but got it, got his chance, got forty one minutes, and I thought it did really well. It wasn't error free, but. It's not like no nobody pitch, nobody's going to be error free on a no, day like that as no, well. That pitch was that pitch was full of yeah. world class players, and and I think nearly all of them made errors. But I thought uh, key moments, he um he just looked like he he has a little bit of momentum behind him. And Saturday against Sale, um, would be a great opportunity for him to to lay down a marker. And then obviously Ross will Ross has to get a chance as well. Um, you know when he gets back, because uh, the first it was really his jersey after Johnny left, but we, we kind of need to see, we, we need to see more, I think we need to see more Kieran Frawley and then more Harry Byrne um, in the sh- in the medium term to let them have a crack at it. And then and obviously Leo and, and Nina Barrow uh, and even Andy Farrell will know kind of who he's going to put his chips on. And John, I think it was something we spoke about last week as well, where so much of these selection things just comes down to the timing and the bit of luck where, someone has an injury and you fall into the into the shirt at the right time and you just happen to to hit your form and take your chance at that moment. Yeah, well, he has an opportunity now uh, in big, big games this weekend. Uh, also into, depends on, you know, when Harry gets back up, you know, with the Interpros over Christmas and then into Europe again um, to see where, where, where he goes and, and what happens. But if he plays well, then you kind of, when your 10s come back, 
his versatility means that okay well where's he going to go or you know we're we going to give him an extended period 10 or we're we going to shift him out to 12 or look at moving him back to 15 so but his form is is as good as uh, as around and like things that I really like was his first action is coming on for penalty and it's straight over the uh, straight mm-hmm. over the, straight over brought the, the brought, brought the tee onto the pitch with him yeah like so you know and that's difficult to do regardless of okay people say well it was an easy enough kick yeah but like he's been sitting on the bench for the last thirty nine minutes um I do feel really sorry for Harry Byrne one of the big things that I really like about him is for their try he creates that try because he squares up when he gets the ball out the back last minute off his outside foot, which brings their 13 to him. And that creates that overlap and he has a quick hand to be able, but if he doesn't square up there and keeps going sideways, they have an opportunity to push it into touch, but it, it was just a real subtle um, use of his footwork and, and a really nice touch hands to, to get in. And yeah, it's, it's frustrating for him, but creates a, uh, an opportunity now where, where he can kind of, um, you know, where for all he can kind of properly get two games, two, three games underneath his belt and see what happens when it comes into the next round. Final point on Leinster, and we'll try, we'll get through it quick enough. Uh, sale this weekend, Birch. Number one, are we going to see Sale sending a full or close to a full team to the RDS? And secondly, if they do, how capable are they of of winning? Because I'm, I'm getting a bit bored in the last few years of seeing second string premiership teams coming to the RDS or the Aviva and losing by 35 40 points. Um I'd like to hope that they uh, that they would send uh, their their best team. Um in fairness Alex Anderson, I played with Alex Anderson in sale um and I've stayed in touch with him. Uh, obviously was a big part of Saracens and and winning winning trophies there. I got back to sale. He he is someone who Who's had great time in this in the Champions Cup and has always um has always respected it. And I and I think that can have a big influence on it. Like Rog obviously went to La Rochelle, a club but out of history in, in, in Europe and uh, made him love it uh, and you know has got to the top of it. So I would I would like to hope um, uh, that La Roche, that sale would be similar and we'll get a real good contest because I think if they bring their best team, it'll be a proper match. And that's the hope, isn't it? Because like and I think for Leinster's Johnny for Leinster's um own development at their season, it's it's what they need. It it feels like in the last few years that the pool stages have come a little bit a little bit too easy for Leinster in recent years, and they've probably gone in a bit undercooked into the latter stages of the competition. If if they can go play La Rochelle last week and get a proper sale team coming to Dublin this weekend, that is that's a hell of a way to start a competition. Yeah, and I think you know, sales trajectory since Sanderson has taken over has has gone up. They're proper genuine contenders in um you know in uh in the premiership. This is something that they want to do. They're building a really good squad um you know to be able to fight on two fronts. They have the capability to do that. Um and I think with the history of the coaching staff, what they've done in previous areas, I think that that all leads to coming over and trying to trying to get a win um but yeah i think it'll be if they do send a cross which i hope they do a, a full it'll be a, a home dinger of a game um because sale are quality quality outfit yeah so that's 5 30 p.m live on rt2 and rt player here so hoping we get a, a decent one on saturday evening at the rds uh we'll move on to monster now 17 all draw against bayon last saturday they're playing exeter one o'clock on sunday afternoon uh birch everything had been lined up in Munster's favour for this one. Home game to start the competition. They were top seeds in the pool, having won the URC. They were playing against first-timers in the competition. Um, They were 14-3 up at halftime. Weren't necessarily playing great, but you got you still got the sense they were going to kick on and and pick up the win and and probably a bonus point with it. With it. Uh, what went wrong? So many errors and, and just gave... Beyond belief, it was uh, it was crazy, and and to be honest, not just errors. They they really struggled to to bully their way over the line. They lost so many kind of collisions in, in tight, and they also struggled. I, I think they missed Frisch badly, and and the message coming out down from the sideline was get the ball into the fifteens. Mossy Dollar was screaming that into to Crowley, but but they just got caught between the two fifteens, and that meant it was all about muscle. Uh, whereas if they can, the way Munster play, if they can just get 
a little bit of form momentum into the 15. Then they play three off nine with Crowley at the back, two off him. Then they pull apart defenders a little bit better. Um, but once it's it's just off nine um, and it's in close quarters, they don't have the bodies, particularly without a dog bow, Snyman, uh, John Klein, um, in particular, even Killer. Killer gives him uh, uh, some carry. Uh, Pete is an area of his game. He's improved. He wouldn't be the biggest carrier in the, in the comp by any means, but he's improved there. Um, and yeah, I, I just felt that they looked, they just looked um, suffocated a little bit and, and couldn't find space. And then when they couldn't find space, they don't really have a, a plan B in that their power game isn't that good. And the same thing happened against Ulster away and Leinster away where they had opportunities four or five yards out. And you, you, you like against the better teams, you'd only get one or two. And against Bayonne, they got lots, but they just couldn't um, use their forwards to to grind away over the line. And every time Bayonne survived, you could see them growing in belief. And um, then they brought on their best players. So oh, sorry, they brought they had a stronger bench than a starting team. And effectively, when they sensed that there was actually a chance of maybe getting something out of the game, and probably they were only realistically that might be losing bonus point. Mm. Um, they brought on some some of the heavy artillery and then finished the game. You know, much stronger. Obviously, Munster had one last chance to get a drop goal or a penalty at the end. And I actually, I watched Crowley from from the point of him taking that restart. And in fairness, I don't think he did anything wrong. Obviously, he lost the boot on the way, but um, he he was just directing traffic, and he was hoping that his team would would get him a penalty. Uh, obviously, which is uh, more likely. Obviously, um, you're hoping maybe you score a try, but they played multiple phases left and right. And they never really got one dominant carry yeah. to allow him drop kick on the front foot. So, like I thought, he waited and waited and waited as long as he possibly could, and then unfortunately, um, he had no boot when he went for it. But he he really couldn't wait any longer. It actually looked at that stage like the next phase or two, Bayon were going to get a, a turnover because Munster were kind of out in their feet. So, um, it was a really good lesson for Munster in the importance of of obviously being accurate and be relentless. But it also I think shows him that. They're, they're, they have they, there's, there's some work to do in, in terms of the overall par, or a plan B, plan C, and um, if teams stop you doing what you want, there is yeah, and it it was funny. you mentioned Fresh at the start of that there it was interesting to see that I mean we most of us assumed he was part of the the injured group but he was togged out and he was doing the warm up so um you'd have to assume that he was available for selection and if someone had picked up an injury in the warm up he he would have been brought into the into the squad. So it was interesting to see he was he was rested for that game and it's something that potentially backfired on Munster. But Johnny, to go back on what Birch was saying on the attack in general and how when it has worked, it's been brilliant. And we saw at times against Leinster how lovely it looked against Glasgow a couple of weeks ago and Graham Rountree had been saying that, you know, it, it was really starting to come together the last few weeks. But it does feel like if you look at that game against Ulster, you look at their draw out in Benetton as well, when when it doesn't work, it just really, really doesn't work. It seems to be an all or nothing thing where it either clicks or it comes nowhere near to clicking. And there there isn't much of an in-between. Yeah, they have to figure that out, how they can, as Bert said, a lot of it is a lot, trying to get to those 15s and launch off those. Also, being able to create the opportunity to get to wit from that. Um, but they have to figure out how they're going to generate quick ball, generate that power, be it even if they don't have big enough guys that they can have quick, enough quick rook ball that it doesn't allow D, D, to, D to set, which allow them to get two passes in and get to that 15. But yeah, they just struggle. Now, I do think there's a depth issue there overall. You look at the guys that are injured and there's, you know, there's a lot of second choice guys that are out, which don't allow... Um, you know, bringing, bringing that power, you know, the younger guys that have kind of, you know, dog about those guys that, you know, someone like him would have, would have added a bit of, a bit of power there. You look at the guys coming off the bench, you know, um, O'Connor in the back line, you know, he's playing for UCC in the AIL. He's going to be on the Irish twenties. It's very difficult for those guys to kind of get acclimatized to European rugby in the melting pot, you know, first or second performance. So, um, that's that is a struggle but they do have to figure out how they can generate power in a smarter way be it through um you know moving the point of contact in a quicker fashion um but yeah like when as i said when they like some of their tries against glasgow like hearns try against glasgow was exceptional and um, but they never seemed to get into full flow at the weekend 
Um, and then, you know, even you look at the last set, you know, as Bert has already said about Crowley, but even then he rushes his drop goal opportunity. You know, he's expecting a good, um, you know, some blockers uh, be on or slow off the line. And then he probably rushes it slightly. And that was kind of that, just that, that anxiety um, with French size in Toman Park, you know, my experience, if you can get more than two scores ahead, you know, if you can get past 14 points, they kind of lie down a bit. Um, and they realize the game has gone. There seemed to be just this anxiety. Let's get get to that, get to that, and then we'll we'll roll. And then when they didn't get to that opportunity, or when they didn't get to that, they kind of went into themselves, and then they weren't able to generate any kind of power, and and they struggled again at, at line out mall. You know, like their try comes from a line out outside of the twenty two, and their winger ends up breaking off the back of that mall when it's just outside the five meter, like that. That can't happen, um, and that's going to be their Achilles heel. Uh, that's going to be another another issue that they have to have to resolve. That's been a, a problem all season long. Line out attack as well, but just line out in general has been a bit of an issue for them. Um, it was funny. I on Saturday I was down pitch side. I was standing beside you, and I'm looking at my notes here in front of me. I've taken down the 28 minute mark. I write down line out really good so far. I think they'd been. 100% for about four to four, five out of five throws, some good clean takes, and it was all looking nice. And literally from the moment I, I wrote that down, the next two lineouts were were lost. I think one was crooked and one might have been lost. But it's been an issue pretty much all season. Uh, you look at the game against Benetton as well in Italy, where they had an absolute disaster at it. And not being able to get clean ball or not being able to do much with the ball they were getting in the lineout and particularly as well, it's it's the where and the when, where the lineups are going wrong. We're seeing them a lot of times in twenty twos or at crucial stages of the game. Um, it's something they badly need to address at this stage, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I'm sure that, I'm sure they have addressed it. Obviously, like, but it's something that needs to be got right. Yeah, for Munster, actually, would you believe I I have concerns about all Irish provinces lineouts and scrum at yeah. the moment, um, and even when they play each other, like Leinster Connacht, it was. It looked like they met in the car park uh, at times, um, and that wasn't always the case. And you're you're now you're now not when they kick to the corner or they kick in twenty two, you're not as confident as as you would have been last year that they were going to get that part the first part right because uh, I think Irish teams in general are pretty good um, of converting those twenty two entries into into points, but not if you lose the ball at, at source. So um, there's certainly a bit of work to be done uh, in that. Munsters, I agree with you. So far this season has been quite erratic. And to be honest, it was it was a big part of Bayon staying in the game. Um, just Munster not being able to capitalize on on some penalties. They kick down the line. You're sure they have a a power play to get them on the front foot to allow them to get into shape, and um, it's not straight or or it's stolen. So, um, big big work on for them. Obviously, going away to Exeter, um, they they need to get that right quickly. Um, they have had a, like some injuries, a hooker and. Uh, some chopping and change as well, but uh, as a whole, the Irish provinces, well, I'd say, are all focusing on on getting that right, and that's an easier fix. Like, there's no reason why we all can't have quality lineouts. Scrum, that's not an easy fix. Um, and personnel wise and size wise, we may come up against teams who who, who are naturally stronger there. But certainly at lineout, um, we and look at this, the Irish lineout in the in the World Cup wasn't mm. firing all cylinders. So and and it can happen. You just lose confidence. Um, maybe we all we're all playing off the similar patterns and we're getting a bit predictable, but um, it is it's, the percentages are starting to drop significantly in terms of successful quality ball winning. So it's like you don't really think it's a coincidence that you know all four Irish provinces are having issues around the the same areas of of line out and scrum and like do do Paul O'Connell and John Fogarty either need to start working more with the provinces or do they need to start working less with them if 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 maybe you're saying is the you know are they all showing the same pictures yeah look at i think they're two separate issues so the scrum the scrum issue is i mean uh, you look at the four props that bayon used um at the weekend they're they're all like bigger more powerful the top 14 is uh, the scrum is absolute core a especially a team like bayon who are who are battlers and We'll, we'll be fighting for top 14 survival again this year. 
that's that's a big part of their makeup to to have an aggressive scrum. And they would put money into that ahead of an outside back. Um, and then you're the up, up end of the circus, so or up end of it is Bay, Bordeaux want to win the top 14. So they will invest in in having five or six quality props. So Carl uh, Sadie, um, Carlos Sadie, who played for the Lions, like he, he demolished Connor, I remember a couple of years ago back when he was the Lions yeah. tight head. Like, demolished Lions as well, I yeah, remember. The Leicester, like he, yeah, Leicester to the RDS, they got tooled up. Like they rarely got tooled up before. And that wasn't their, their first choice, but like he has that ability. Went to Sharks. He's probably not suited to the URC, to be honest. He's not a, a typical URC prop because that's effectively all he does. Um, mm-hmm. but but by God, is he is he attractive to, to top fourteen? So he's he's probably made about a five hundred percent a year pay increase to go to Bordeaux and come on for twenty minutes and help them win games away from home or or um or or, or, or change the picture at home. So that's that's the reality of it. But the lineouts are different. The lineouts is a different issue. I don't know why they're all starting to. Um, malfunction at the same time. I suppose from a Connor point of view, you have a new lineup coach, Muldoon. Um, and uh, he's obviously changing, you know, the way they 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 attack, and it just looks like they're not on the same page. Um, you know, Munster, there's stability there. Obviously, they've lost. There's been a bit of chop and change, and Pete's out, and obviously he he probably gives them another option and gives them a bit of composure. Um, yeah, Leinster against Connacht. It was very much a second string Leinster pack, um, and in general, I wouldn't have massive worries about them. And then Ulster can be have been up and down a little bit as well, despite that being a big part of their game. So yeah, I don't I don't know why I don't know why it is. Um, I probably need to put all of them into a into a folder and have a look at them, um, and see what the patterns are. But um, certainly it's an area we 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 need to tidy up on. Certainly is to to come back around to Munster Johnny and this weekend away to Exeter an incredibly tough place to go. Munster know that from their last two visits there, the defeat a couple of years ago in the last 16 first leg. And I think 2018 was that draw as well. I think it was like an eight all game. I was at it. It was a, an absolute dog fight. But anyway, uh, on the plus side, it looks like they're potentially getting a few players back. There's seven of that injured list are back in some form of, you know, are being moderate, moderate or, what is it? A moderated training or something like that, or modified training. Um, this week, so they're in contention at the very least. One of those, Peter O'Mahony as well, and Diarmid Barron, uh, potentially available. The with the way that pool went last weekend, there is the consolation that because Exeter beat Toulouse and because Glasgow had that surprise win, or uh, Northampton had that surprise win away to Glasgow. If Munster were to go and win this weekend against Exeter, they probably are back in the driving seat for that pool because we've had a few surprise results already. Uh, yeah, now Exeter had a great win and Henry Slade knocks over that kick at the end. Like, they're in good form. Um, you know, they've kind of consolidated a bit over the last couple of years. Um, but Stanley Park's a real difficult place to go. Um, it's a great place to play. Um, but, yeah, it's going to be really difficult out there. Um, I think they need the... As you said, that heavy artillery coming back into the into the team to give them a to give them a chance, but um, it's going to be very very hard 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 for them over there. Um, I think if they can get everyone fit and they can, you know, Exeter might not have um, uh, you know, they, both teams will want to play. Um, it might suit the style that that Munster have um in trying to get to those fifteens as we've as we've already spoken about, but. Yeah, it's going to be... There is a big card for them to try and get something out of that game. But I think it's going to be hard hard for them. Just, you know, two different levels of energy coming into this week. Um, There's obviously going to be a bite back. And they're historically, you know, there always is that for Munster. Um, but, yeah, Exeter are, are, you know, that energy and that momentum from a win away and someone like Toulouse. You can't underestimate what that's going to do to do for a squad this week in training. Yeah, so that game is 1 p.m. Sunday afternoon. Um, We'll talk about Connacht and Ulster. I know we're running out of time, but uh, two very disappointing defeats. Birch, firstly on Connacht, pretty much outplayed from the sixth or seventh minute onwards. Connacht had started well, a couple of decent opportunities. And going back to what we were talking about a few minutes ago, a couple of lineouts go astray for them and, and they missed their chance. But Bordeaux steam up the pitch, score a try. And from there they were by far the better team. 
did coming into that game, Connacht were a couple of point favourites. Did we massively overestimate Connacht or did we underestimate Bordeaux? Underestimated Bordeaux, I think, um, weren't sure how seriously they take it. Um, like I think, I think what we saw in Bayonne and Bordeaux post match, um, and also on the field is is how respected the Irish provinces are in, in in Europe and how the mindset in the French team has, has French teams has changed a little bit. In in general, most of them see it as an opportunity to to do something. You know, really special. I mean, the way Bordeaux celebrated afterwards mm. was, in fairness, it was a brilliant away performance, five points, pretty ruthless. And maybe it's it's a sign of their they've they've turned things around and and they're they're really a different type of team. Um, Bayon obviously will try and use it. I mean, on Ruby Rama was the exploit of the weekend was Bayon getting a draw in Munster. You know what I mean? Um, because uh, that's how it's seen in France, and that's how where Munster is seen in terms of European legacy. Um. I think we expected more from Connacht and on paper we probably shouldn't have expected them to, to, to be favourites or to win because when you match up player v player um, you know Bordeaux is full of international quality players and Connacht aren't yes uh, and maybe never some of those players won't have the careers that some of those Bordeaux players um, have already had or will have um, but we expected it to be a difficult night you know uh, home crowd a bit of reaction, you know, Connacht players being excited about being in the Champions Cup, having a big French team come to town and getting stuck into them and 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 make it difficult for them and and they didn't, you know, they didn't they didn't start that badly. I, I thought the first half, you know, they were they were average enough, but you didn't believe I didn't believe at halftime the game was over. I, I oh, felt, they were they were still yeah. well in touch at halftime. Connor, Connor score next and it's game on, but obviously Bordeaux scored quickly and then I thought it was just it was very, one of those really horrible horrible nights for for any team um where you don't look like you have the fight that you do have the rest of the year you kind of lose confidence of your of your fans and you make the coaching staff kind of question what they're what they're trying to do and and that's and that can change in sport uh, over the course of 40 minutes it, it it can put everything under scrutiny it doesn't mean that it's the end of anything um you know you can get back on track but it does Challenge the character of the players, and and now they go to Saris. And I, look, they don't need to win in Saris. I mean, Connacht are going to win the Champions Cup, and never were. But um, you would expect that they need to get something out of the game in terms of performance going into Christmas, or else, and 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 probably that's probably overestimated because Connacht in general, when they play in the Irish province, find a way of 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 raising their game and and being competitive, but. You just wouldn't you 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 wouldn't like to see them. I certainly wouldn't like to see them drop off now and 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 go. Was it Bulls, um, Leinster, Bor- uh, Bordeaux, Saris, and then two Irish into provincials? Go six seven games and back into Europe again. Six seven games without a win. Um, that would be that would be a a pretty bleak uh, period for them. And uh, yeah, so I'm sure it's been a big week there. And I don't think it'll be a big week on the training field. It's a big week in terms of trying to find out why they underperformed so badly and to, to fix it. And I'll, Johnny, I'll kind of bring Ulster in on this as well because it's it's a similar team with themselves and Connacht in the, the second half of, of their games. Uh, Ulster losing 37-14 to Bath. But as Birch kind of said, like once once the game got a little bit away from them early on in the second half, they just crumbled. And Pete Wilkins came out this week and he flat out rejected the suggestion that the players gave up, but it was, it was obvious the heads had dropped and it was a similar situation that happened to, to Ulster where they were they were leading the game at half time, even after falling 18-14 behind with 20 uh, odd minutes to go, they were still very much in it, even though Bath had probably played the, the better rugby to that stage and, and had been on top, but it it was a little bit concerning for both of those teams the way once it started to turn against them, it just fell apart very, very quickly. Yeah, Ulster, like, you know, the try just before half time is an incredible piece of play. You then think, right, that's the moment that they're going to kick on, you know, because people have been talking about they need a moment. They need, you know, they need this win that'll push them past kind of the uh, you know, the really good and really bad. They'll then and you're thinking at half time, right, this is it now. And then you know, the second half was just so disappointing for them. Um, and 
that's they just couldn't manage that momentum. Now back again, similar to Bordeaux, I think people probably underestimate him. They've assembled a really good squad. They've a good scrum, good mall. Um, they've um, you know, a, a halfback pairing. You know, Spencer has won it a couple of times with uh, Saris, um, you know, obviously, um, you know, Finn Russell has lost in the final, so they've been there. They know what it takes to get to the knockout stages and push on and win and lose. And you know they they're assembling a really good side and they play good good rugby, but yeah, there's just something to mess up in in you know in in Ulster and and I don't know what it is and we've been speaking about it for a while. They just they're really good or there's not a whole lot there and it's just how how do you put the how do you put your finger on it externally? The coaches obviously are working on it every week, but it can create a lot of doubt um and you question yourself around certain things as a coaching staff as players but they need to get some type of kind of marker win or something that puts them down to say right okay this is what's us and you just felt at half time that was it and they just didn't pull through on it um so yeah there's just something awry and and they have to try and figure it out because it's a, again it's a you know they're they're going to be a tough couple of weeks for for both. It, if is. They don't, you it know. is, and and Bert, you were talking about it the other day on the the forty two podcast where Dan McFarland's at a pretty crucial stage in his Ulster tenure now, where it was similar last season where they went into this de- December tailspin, uh, which lasted the whole way through until pretty much the end of January, and it feels like they're. They're not quite in that at the moment, but if they're not careful, another couple of results and they are in that exact same table tailspin where the season ult- ultimately comes off the rails by the new year. Yeah, and I saw the quote come back to me kind of saying that it's the mo- most challenging period of his coaching career. And I, and I was like, am I being harsh? But uh, the reason I don't think I am, I think it's because of what's happened in the past. It's, it's, you know, yeah. I think it's not a massive, like the, it's not a crisis crisis, but effectively I, I i think they've kind of stumbled through the early part of the season you know average enough beating the lines at home lucky enough to beat Munster at home but they, they're, they're wins right uh, but then obviously losing to edinburgh at home and then the way they blew up in in that second half in in bass um and just the general vibe out of the the squad and the fans up there is 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 um is pretty is pretty poor so that's 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 the context of it um and as i said it's 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 different for pete wilkins because it's a, it's a kind of it's a new 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 coaching group. It'll take a while. Whereas obviously you just kind of feel that it's it's now or never for Ulster um, to to find the right um, groove to, coming out of this and make sure it's just a little blip and have a really good you know Christmas and and into the into next season. Because yeah, you're right. They made the playoffs in the end, but they kind of limped into it. I, I felt. Um, so yeah, that's it. Is a it is a, it's going to be really interesting how they bounce back and look at you know a team like Racing coming to. To Ravenhill, if you're a player, whether you went to the World Cup or whether you've never been an international, if you're an Ulster man, this is this is what you want. You know what I mean? This is there's been so many teams in the past who pulled off brilliant performances in, under lights or, uh, or in Ravenhill um, against big opposition. So this is this is this is what you want to bounce back from bat with a with a quality side coming and and to be honest, Racing watching them against Quins and watching them in the top fourteen so far this season. They're obviously a brilliant team, but they're very open. They're yeah. very open. Like they they let you have chances. You know what I mean? Um uh and it's probably Stuart, it's Stuart's influence, you know. Um the uh, and they play more than they used to, or, or certainly on the last couple of years, but that does give you opportunities. So it it'll like Ulster will have chances if they're if they're ready to take them. Yeah, and Johnny, you only have to go back a couple of years as well, like a few years, I think 20, 18, 19, 20. Rassing are a big name, but a lot of the Ulster players who are going to be playing this weekend will have played Rassing and will have beaten Rassing 92 before. So, you know, it's it's not that daunting for the the quality of players they have who, who've actually been there and beaten a team of this calibre, beaten this exact same team only a few years ago. They know how to do it. Yeah, definitely. And look, they're coming home to their home supporters. So there's an opportunity for a good bounce back and to have that statement win that they've been trying to get for 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 a while, um, and they're they're quality they're quality players in that squad. Um, 
and they just need to try and put a you know a, a full a full game performance together um but i don't think they'll be they'll be fearing anything this weekend um their confidence might be not but they know that they have it, have it in them and they just need to get it out um and it's but they have to deliver on on that now they've been so they've been too close to not deliver and it's an opportunity for them to deliver and and you know i it can change Spurs already said like it can change in 20 minutes 25 minutes um and that's what they have to do that's what they have to concentrate on um but yeah it's this opportunity for them against someone that you know it, it's different to it's different to uh, Connacht. You know, Connacht are going to Saracens after Saris lost away. That's a much diff- more difficult task. They're taking Racing um, at home after losing away. Yes, they're a quality side, but if they can get ahead, are they going to going to drop down? So they really need to, you know, just put in that performance that they've been looking for. Yeah, that's where we will uh, wrap it up for the day. Year um just, just AI quickly, Go ahead, Birch. Uh, just Irish fans might be interested. John O'Gibbs is back in coaching. Um, he obviously former Leinster coach and Ulster coach. He's the new under twenties head coach for New Zealand and a resource coach for the Chiefs. So, um, he's he's back in the game. Interesting to see that. Yeah. Um, we'll finish up there. And Johnny, uh, I was chatting to you off air just before we were we were getting set up and started. AIL hitting the midpoint this week. The the last round before Christmas. Year two out of two in this little mini block, hoping to cap things off nicely this weekend. Highfield at home, is it? Yeah, Highfield at home. So, um, yeah, hopefully we can have a good Christmas party after. Um, yeah, look, we've been going well. We didn't have a great performance last weekend, but we managed to to get over the line. You see, we're probably unlucky against us. Um, but yeah, there it's a crazy league, a league where you can be fourth and finish eighth at the end of a, a round of fixtures. Uh, you know, start at half two and in, in fourth and finish at four o'clock and eight. So uh, yeah, every point matters. Um, but if we can close out this this block with uh with another win, we're in a we're in a good old spot. So hopefully it'll be a a good day at home and we can enjoy ourselves after after the game. Yeah, one B has been a, a bit of a bear pit for the last few years. But um the Champions Cup games this weekend from an Irish perspective, no teams playing Friday evening. Saracens Connacht is one PM Saturday afternoon. Leinster hosts sale at five thirty PM. That's live on RT two and RT player. And then at eight o'clock, Ulster take on Racing ninety two at Kingspan Stadium. Then on Sunday, it's an early kickoff for Exeter and Munster, one PM. Commentary of the first half is on RT Radio One Extra and then uh, Radio One for the second half on Sunday sport. But uh, that's where we'll leave it for the pod this week. Thanks to Johnny and Bernard as usual. Enjoy the games this weekend, guys. And uh, we'll speak to you again soon.